I opened my eyes, but I couldn't see anything. It was completely dark. There was no light at all. Everything was black. I closed my eyes and opened them again, but still, I could see nothing. Where was I? I realized I was lying on my back, on something hard and cold. I reached out my hand and felt a stone floor, cold and damp beneath my fingers. I was lying in a stone room. Could it be a tomb? Was I in a place where the dead were buried? I knew I had to move and find out. I turned over onto my hands and knees, then started to crawl forward. In a few seconds, I reached a wall. It was cold and wet. Maybe I was in a room that was underground. I followed the wall very slowly, thinking I was moving in a circle, though I wasn't sure. Suddenly, an idea struck me. I tore a piece of cloth from my shirt and placed it on the floor near the wall. Then I continued along the wall, counting the number of times I moved my hands forward. Twenty, thirty, forty times. But where was the cloth? Had I passed it in the dark? Had I gone around the room twice? I counted up to one hundred before I found the piece of cloth again. However, I hadn't found a dead body in a coffin. I wasn't in a tomb. Where was I? I tried to remember. I recalled being in Toledo, Spain. Then, I remembered a courtroom and men in red robes. They had asked me questions, more and more questions. Their voices were soft their eyes bright. How many hours had they questioned me? I couldn't recall. The questions had gone on and on. But what was my crime? What law had I broken? I didn't know. Fear gripped me. I thought the questioners were going to torture me. But no one had cut me with sharp blades. No one had struck me. And no one had burned me with hot iron. Now I must be in a jail, a prison cell. Maybe I would die here without food, water, or light. I closed my eyes again, and I must have slept. When I awoke, I moved my foot, and it hit something. I reached out and touched a loaf of bread and a pitcher of water. A jailer had come into my prison cell and left food and drink. I knew that my prison cell was large, but what was in the center? For a few minutes, I sat with my back against the wall. Then I started to crawl straight ahead across the floor of the cell. I moved very slowly. Suddenly, my hand went down and forward. I had found a hole, a pit in the floor. I could feel and smell damp air rising from the pit. I guessed that the pit was very deep. I had almost fallen into it. My body shook with fear. And my skin was covered with sweat. The drops of sweat fell from my face and down into the deep hole. Suddenly, I heard a noise. A small door opened above my head, and light shone down on me for a few seconds. I saw my prison cell. Then the small door shut again, and everything was dark and black. I was right. I was in a room with a deep pit in its center. I understood now.
my torturers had been waiting and watching. They wanted me to jump into the deep pit. They wanted me to end my life. I slowly crawled back to the pitcher of water and the bread. My arms and legs were shaking. I was weak and too tired. I took a piece of bread and started to eat. The bread tasted of salt. I quickly drank the water from the pitcher. Soon after this, I felt very, very tired, and I slept again. When I awoke, the cell was not completely dark. I could just see its walls. The room was square, and each wall was about 15 feet long. The walls were not made of stone. They were made of metal. High in the center of the ceiling, there was a small door. Strange and terrible pictures were carved into the metal walls. The pictures were of evil spirits and monsters. I was lying on my back, but I could not get up. I was no longer lying on the stone floor. My body was tied to a wooden bed, and a rope was tied around my chest, but I could move my arms. I reached out my hands and tried to find the pitcher of water. I was very thirsty. There was no water, but I found a dish of meat. I put a piece of the meat into my mouth. No, I could not eat the meat. I looked it up at the terrible, and it saw was full a of salt there. and strong spices. It was a picture of time. My jailers wanted me to be thirsty. An old man with a long beard. This was a new torture. Pictures of time always showed an old bearded man with an hourglass in his hand. Hourglasses had two containers inside them, made of glass joined in the center. One of the containers was filled with sand. When all the sand had run from one container to the other, an hour had passed. Time also held a long, sharp scythe. Every living thing is killed by time. But in the picture on the ceiling, the blade of time's scythe was not part of the painting. It was real, and it was sharp. It was made of metal, and hung down from the ceiling. The blade was like the pendulum of an old clock. As I watched, the pendulum started to move. It moved slowly, backward and forward. Suddenly, I heard a noise beside me. It was the sound of many small animals running on hard ground. Then I heard high, sharp cries. Rats. There were rats here in the cell. They had climbed out of the pit. Several large, black rats ran across the floor toward my wooden bed. I moved my arms and shouted, trying to frighten them away. The rats looked at me with their red eyes. They opened their mouths, and I saw their sharp, pointed teeth. Were the rats going to be my next torture? I looked up at the pendulum again. It was moving more quickly now. As it moved backward and forward, it made a soft whooshing sound. Whoosh! The pendulum swung back behind my head, and I could not see it. Then it swung forward over my feet. Whoosh! As I watched, I saw that the pendulum was lowering. Very slowly, the pendulum was getting closer to me. Now I saw the reason for the pendulum. This was how I was going to die. The sharp blade of the pendulum was going to kill me. But it was not going to kill me quickly. It was going to cut my body very, very slowly. The pain would be terrible. 
How many times was the blade going to cut my body? How long was I going to lie on the wooden bed? How many times was I going to scream as my blood ran onto the floor? One of the rats ran over my hand. I cried out and pulled my hand away quickly. The dish of meat was still beside me. The rats could smell the meat, and they wanted it. Suddenly, I had an idea. I reached out my hand and took some of the meat from the dish. Then I rubbed the spiced meat onto the rope that was around my body. I rubbed the meat all along the rope. Then I lifted my hands above my head and lay still. At first, the rats were scared of me. They didn't come too close. Then one of them jumped onto my chest. I stayed still, even though I wanted to move. I felt the rat's tiny sharp feet on my body. I saw its red eyes and sharp teeth. I tried not to scream. The rat moved closer to the rope, smelling the spiced meat. It started biting the rope with its sharp teeth. Soon, another rat jumped onto me. It also started to eat the rope. More and more rats came, running over my face and body. I kept my mouth and eyes closed, trying not to shout in fear. I tried to stop my body from shaking. The rat's feet and tails touched me. I felt them on my mouth, eyes, and nose. I heard their high, sharp cries. The sound of the pendulum became louder. The whooshing noise of the pendulum was louder than the rat's. The blade was getting closer to my body. I felt the air move as it passed over my face. The pendulum swung widely. I counted each time it passed over me. Six seconds. Seven seconds. Then the blade swung back. Six. Seven. Whoosh. The pendulum swung lower and lower. It was now just inches above me, moving slower. The huge blade scared the rats, and they ran away. They knew they were in danger. They had eaten part of the rope, but I wasn't free yet. I waited for the pendulum to cut the rope completely. Seven seconds. Eight seconds. The pendulum whooshed above my body from head to foot, then foot to head. Seven, eight, whoosh. It was very close now. I tried to make my body lower on the bed. Where was the blade going to cut me? My head? My chest? My stomach? I screamed. The blade cut, and it sliced through the rope. The pendulum swung toward my feet. Suddenly, I was free. I jumped from the wooden bed and lay on the floor. Sweat was pouring from my skin, and I was breathing fast. The pendulum whooshed past one more time. Then it stopped. The small door in the ceiling was open. My torturers were watching. They had seen me escape from the blade. Suddenly, the pendulum moved back into the ceiling and stopped. But I wasn't safe yet. A little later, I smelled something new. It wasn't the smell of rats or the dark pit. It was the smell of hot iron. The metal walls of the cell were getting hot. I moved closer to the pit. It was cooler there. This was part of their plan. They were heating the walls. 
When the cell became too hot, I would have to jump into the pit. The pit was cool and damp, but the cell walls weren't just hot. They were moving, too. The hot metal walls were moving toward me. The pictures of the evil spirits and monsters were now red. They were getting hotter. I was going to burn on the walls or fall into the pit. I didn't have much time. I stood on the edge of the pit and closed my eyes. The walls, floor, and air were hot. I felt the terrible heat on my face and hands. I was ready to fall. This was the end. I was going to die in this horrible place. Suddenly, I heard voices. People were shouting. I heard guns. People were fighting. Then I heard another sound. The walls were moving again. What was happening now? I was weak and tired, my arms and legs shaking. The walls were moving back, but it was too late. My clothes were starting to burn. I was about to fall. I was already falling. Then someone grabbed my arm and pulled me back. I turned my head and saw the person who saved me. It was a soldier, wearing the uniform of the French army. French soldiers had captured the city of Toledo. All the prisoners were free. Many years ago, I first met Mr. William Legrand, who lived on Sullivan's Island near Charleston. The island is situated in the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of South Carolina. Sullivan's Island is quite small, stretching three miles in length and just over half a mile in width. A narrow creek separates the island from the mainland. On the island stood a single large building, Fort Moultrie, where soldiers were stationed to guard the South Carolina coast. Legrand had once been wealthy, but he lost all his money. His fine house and property in New Orleans were sold, and he left Louisiana, eventually settling on Sullivan's Island. He had no family, his parents were deceased, and he had no siblings, spouse, or children. He lived with a servant named Jupiter Legrand in a small wooden house by the sea. They caught fish and birds for food and rarely visited Charleston, despite its proximity. I lived in Charleston and sometimes visited Legrand by crossing the creek in a small boat. Legrand was an intriguing man with a good education, but also a peculiar disposition. He enjoyed the solitude of his island home and often went for days without speaking. However, when he was excited, he could talk for hours. During my visits, we discussed many topics, including the books he had read and the wildlife around his home. He even drew pictures of the creatures he observed. One October day, I visited Legrand's home, but no one was there. As it was cold, I went into his small wooden house, started a fire, and waited. Later in the afternoon, Legrand and Jupiter returned. They had been exploring the shore and discovered an unusual insect. Legrand was very excited about this insect, describing it as having strange patterns on its back. When I asked to see the insect, Legrand said it was with Lieutenant Gray, who had shown interest in it. He had taken it to the fort, hoping to identify it. Legrand then began to draw a picture of the insect for me. It was a beetle with a round body and six legs adorned with three unusual marks. 
I commented that it resembled a scarab, a type of beetle once believed to have magical properties in ancient Egypt. Jupiter then interjected that the insect was not alive, but made of gold. Legrand dismissed this and said that, despite the golden color, the marks on its back were in the shape of a skull, two small spots above a larger one, resembling eyes and a mouth. This pattern, known as a death's head, suggested something significant. Six o'clock in the morning, and in his little house in a little village in Mexico, Mario was asleep. Mario was a man who loved his sleep. Every morning, while the rest of the village was awake and bustling with activity, Mario remained in bed, enjoying his dreams. He was still asleep at seven, at eight, at nine, and at ten. Most days, Mario woke up at about eleven. Then his wife usually went to the shop to buy tortillas and coffee for his breakfast. Mario was a lucky man, because Pedro, the shopkeeper, was a good friend, and never asked him to pay for his food. Mario was a lucky man because Pedro, the shopkeeper, was a good friend of Mario's. He never asked Mario to pay for the food he provided, even though he worked hard every day, waking up at 5 a.m. to open his shop. But one morning, as Pedro was getting ready for another long day of work, he felt a wave of frustration wash over him. Why do I get up so early to work hard while Mario lies in bed doing nothing? He thought. He doesn't work, and I give him free food. That's enough. If he wants more free food, he'll have to earn it. Later that morning, when Mario's wife arrived at the shop at her usual time, Pedro decided to put his plan into action. Tell your husband that I can't give him any more free food. I'm building an extra room on the side of my house. If he helps me carry some large rocks from the quarry, then you can have more food. Oh no, Mario said, when Mario's wife told him what Pedro, those rocks are too heavy for me to move he complained. How many times must I say, if God wants to give, he'll give, and when he gives, he'll push it in through the window. Please, no more talk of work. What about a nice cup of fresh coffee? And with that, Mario put on his clothes and left the house to take a walk. Mario was walking up the hill, happily watching the clouds in the sky, Suddenly he heard frantic shouts behind him. Whoa! Whoa there! Turning round, A he saw a horse galloping towards him at full speed, with an old man riding it and shouting desperately. Whoa! The rider shouted again. But the— The horse was out of control and charging directly towards Mario. Now the horse was right in front of Mario. Without thinking, Mario jumped forward, grabbed the horse's reins, and managed to bring it to a stop. The rider was an old man with long, white hair. He got down. You don't run around all day like other people, he said to Mario, but you're there when someone needs you. You're very kind, replied Mario, but to be like this is not hard. I try to sleep well, eat well and not worry about things. Well, today you really help me, said the old man, and so I want to give you a gift of God. A gift of God? I don't understand, said Mario. When God gives a gift to somebody, the old man explained, only the person that God gives it to can keep it. Follow me. Mario followed him, and they went up the hill. There, the old man stopped and showed him a large rock. Under that rock are some leaves. Under the leaves are some chests. 
in the chests, you'll find the gift of God waiting for you. Mario went over to the rock, knelt by it, and took it in his hands. He moved it easily. Then he moved the leaves and saw six chests made of wood. Slowly, he opened one of the chests. Inside, there were hundreds of silver coins. He opened a second chest, and a third. All six chests were full of silver coins. Mario turned to thank the old man, but strangely, he wasn't there anymore. Mario picked up some of the coins and put them in his pocket. Then he closed all six chests, put leaves over them again, and put back the rock. Now, after all this work, he felt tired. He sat down under a tree and went to sleep. When Mario woke up, he was hungry. He remembered something about a horse, an old man, and some silver. Did it really happen? Or was it just a dream, he said to himself. But then he remembered something much more important. Lunch. He started walking quickly down the hill to his house. Suddenly, he heard a clinking noise. He put his hand in his pocket and found six silver coins there. Silver. That evening, Mario's wife went back to the shop. She put the coins in Pedro's hand. My husband sends you these. We need rice, a chicken, tortillas, tomatoes, and coffee. Pedro's mouth fell open when he saw the silver coins in his hand. How did Mario get so much money? he asked. Come to our house tomorrow morning after eleven trust, the wife said, and he'll tell you. The next morning, Pedro heard the story. He wasn't really sure if it was true, but he cried, Mario? Why didn't you bring all those chests home with you? They were too heavy, Mario explained. I needed horses to carry them, and I have no horses. And my friend, how many times have I told you? If God wants to give, he'll give. And when he gives, he'll push it in through the window. I know, Pedro said. I have some horses. I'll come to your house tonight and we'll go to this place together. My horses will carry all six chests. You will keep three of them and give the other three to me. We'll become rich together. Do you agree? All right, said Mario. He was happy because his wife was cooking a delicious chicken for dinner. Pedro went back to his shop, but he began to think, why must I share the silver with Mario? The horses belong to me. Without them, Mario can do nothing, and he won't know what to do with the money. He'll just eat and sleep as usual. But I always know what to do with money. I'll build a larger house. That night at eleven Nalsus, Mario was asleep. Husband, said his wife, wake up. It's already eleven, says, and your friend hasn't come. He's just late, said Mario, and he went back to sleep. An hour later, the wife woke her husband again. Husband, it's midnight, and I'm afraid that Pedro has decided to keep all the silver for himself. Midnight. It's too late to go anywhere now, wife. Go to sleep. After that, Mario and his wife slept all through the night without waking up again. While Mario was sleeping... Pedro went up the hill with his horses and his men. He told the men to move the rock and look under the leaves. They found the six chests. Open them, Pedro said. But when they opened them, they saw no silver coins inside, only lots of dirt and stones. My friend Mario is laughing at me. He thinks that this is funny, Pedro shouted. Well, I know how to be funny too. He told his men to put the chests onto the horses, carry them down the hill, and leave all the dirt and stones in front of Mario's house. They did this, and then went back home. The next morning, when Mario's wife woke up, she couldn't open the door or window. Husband, wake up, she said. There's something outside our house, and we can't open the door or the window. Mario got out of bed 
and he pushed the door. He couldn't open it, not even a crack. He pushed the window, and at last it opened a crack. Lots of silver coins came through the crack and fell onto the floor. Husband, the wife said, Pedro did come last night. Perhaps, replied Mario, but all this work has made me hungry. What about a nice cup of coffee? Later that morning, the shopkeeper's mouth fell open for the second time in two days. Mario's wife came into the shop and bought more food and new clothes for herself and Mario. She put twenty silver coins down in front of the shopkeeper. What happened yesterday? We waited for you until midnight, she said. I was worried when you didn't come. Then this morning, it all came through the window. But surely you gave us more than half. It wasn't me, Pedro said quickly. Of course it was. Who else would leave all those silver coins outside our house? There was silence. Then Pedro said quietly, Your husband always says that if God wants to give, he'll give. And that when he gives, he'll push it in through the window. Push it in. in the peaceful village of Smileville, Lily's smile could brighten anyone's day. But when a sudden storm shakes the village to its core, everything changes. As Lily faces the greatest challenge of her life, her words and actions become a beacon of hope. You have to hear the last line of Lily's story. It's a lesson that will stay with you long after the story ends. In a small, peaceful village called Smileville lived a young girl named Lily. He village was known for its beauty, with flowers blooming in every garden and the sound of birds singing in the trees. But what made Smileville truly special was its people. They were kind, friendly, and always ready to help one another. But like every place in the world, not everything was perfect. Sometimes things didn't go as planned and people faced problems. Lily was known for her bright smile and positive attitude. No matter what happened, she always found a reason to be happy. Her friends often wondered how she could stay so cheerful, even when things were tough. Whether it was helping an old man carry his groceries or playing with the children in the village square, Lily's smile was contagious. The villagers loved Lily for her kindness and positive attitude. Whenever someone felt sad or had a problem, they would go to Lily and she would find a way to make them feel better. Her parents, who owned a small bakery, were proud of her. They would often say, Lily, you have a heart of gold. Never lose your smile. Life in Smileville was peaceful. The villagers lived simple lives, growing their own food, raising animals, and enjoying the beauty of nature. Every morning, the sun would rise over the hills, casting a warm glow over the village and the people would begin their day with smiles on their faces. Children would run through the fields, playing games and laughing, while the adults worked in their gardens or shops. In the evenings, the villagers would gather in the square to share stories, sing songs, and enjoy each other's company. It was a place where everyone felt safe, loved, and happy. But one day, everything changed. It was a day like any other in Smileville. The sun was shining, and the villagers were going about their daily tasks. Lily was helping her mother bake bread in their cozy little bakery. The smell of fresh bread filled the air, and people stopped by to buy a loaf or two. Suddenly, dark clouds began to gather in the sky. The wind started to pick up, and soon the sun was hidden behind thick gray clouds. The villagers looked up worried. It wasn't normal for the weather to change so quickly. Within minutes, the sky turned black and a powerful storm hit the village. The wind howled, tearing through the trees and ripping roofs off houses. The rain came down in torrents, flooding the streets and fields. The storm was like nothing the villagers had ever seen before. Lily and her family huddled inside their bakery, watching as the wind and rain lashed against the windows. They could hear the sound of trees crashing to the ground and the cries of frightened animals. 
The storm raged on for hours, and when it finally passed, Smileville was left in ruins. The villagers emerged from their homes to find their village unrecognizable. Trees were uprooted, roofs were missing, and the once beautiful fields were flooded and covered in debris. The storm had caused terrible damage, and the villagers were devastated. People wandered through the streets, looking at the destruction in shock. Some were crying, others were silent, too stunned to speak. It was hard to believe that their peaceful village had been turned upside down in just a few hours. But even in the midst of this disaster, there was one person who remained calm and positive, Lily. As Lily looked around at the damage, she felt a deep sadness for her village and its people. But she knew that being sad wouldn't help. She had always believed that there was a way to find happiness in every situation, no matter how bad it seemed. And this time, she knew she had to be strong, not just for herself, but for the whole village. Lily's parents were worried about the bakery. The storm had damaged the roof, and water had flooded the shop. They didn't know how they would repair it, or how they would continue to make a living. But Lily took their hands and said, Don't worry. We can fix this. We just need to work together. The village needs us now more than ever. Lily's positive attitude gave her parents hope. They knew that she was right. If they all worked together, they could rebuild their village and make it even better than before. Lily decided to visit every house in the village to check on the people and see what they needed. She knew that many of her neighbors would be feeling scared and hopeless, and she wanted to help them find the strength to keep going. As she walked through the village, she saw the damage up close. The fields, which had been full of crops ready for harvest, were now covered in mud and debris. Many houses had lost their roofs, and some had been completely destroyed. The streets were littered with broken branches, fallen trees, and pieces of wood from shattered homes. But Lily also saw something else. She saw the villagers coming together, helping each other clean up the mess. Some were clearing the streets, while others were comforting those who had lost their homes. Despite the destruction, there was a sense of unity in the air. The storm had brought them closer together. When Lily arrived at her best friend Emma's house, she found Emma and her family trying to clear the debris from their garden. The storm had knocked down a large tree, and it had fallen right across their vegetable patch, crushing the plants and breaking the fence. Emma looked up when she saw Lily and ran to her, tears in her eyes. Lily, our garden is ruined. We were counting on those vegetables for the winter. What are we going to do? Lily hugged Emma and said, I know it looks bad, but we can replant the garden. The soil will be rich with rainwater, and with a little hard work, we can grow even more vegetables than before. And you don't have to do it alone. We'll all help you. Emma wiped her tears and nodded. You're right, Lily. We can do this. Thank you for always being so positive. Lily smiled and helped Emma and her family clear the fallen tree from the garden. As they worked, other villagers came by and offered to help. Soon there was a group of people working together, sharing tools, and giving each other encouragement. The garden was cleared in no time, and Emma's family felt much better, knowing they had the support of their friends. As the days passed, the villagers began to rebuild Smileville. It wasn't easy, and there were many challenges along the way, but they didn't give up. Lily was always there, cheering them on, finding ways to lift their spirits, and reminding them that they were strong enough to overcome anything. Lily's family worked hard to repair their bakery. They fixed the roof, cleaned up the flood water, and replaced the damaged furniture. It took time, but they were determined to reopen their shop. Lily's mother, who was known for her delicious bread, started baking again as soon as the oven was fixed. The smell of fresh bread filled the air once more, bringing a sense of normalcy back to the village. Other villagers were busy repairing their homes and fields. The men worked together to rebuild roofs and walls, 
while the women and children cleaned up the debris and replanted gardens. Everyone had a role to play, and they all worked together like a big family. Lily continued to visit her neighbors every day. She brought food to those who couldn't cook, helped with the rebuilding efforts, and spent time with the children, keeping them entertained while their parents worked. She knew that staying positive was the key to getting through this difficult time, and she made sure to spread that positivity wherever she went. One day, Lily visited Mr. Thompson, an elderly man who lived alone at the edge of the village. His house had been badly damaged by the storm, and he was too old to do the repairs himself. When Lily arrived, she found him sitting on his porch, looking sad and tired. Hello, Mr. Thompson, Lily said with a smile. How are you doing today? Mr. Thompson sighed. Not too well, I'm afraid, Lily. My roof is leaking and I can't seem to fix it on my own. I'm worried that I'll have to leave my home if it can't be repaired. Lily's heart went out to the old man. She knew how much his home meant to him. Don't worry, Mr. Thompson, she said. You're not alone. The village will help you fix your house, and we won't stop until it's as good as new. Mr. Thompson looked up at Lily, his eyes filled with gratitude. Thank you, Lily. You always know the right thing to say. Lily quickly gathered a group of villagers to help Mr. Thompson. They worked together to repair his roof, fix the walls, and clean up the yard. Mr. Thompson was overjoyed to see his home being restored, and he couldn't thank Lily and the others enough for their kindness. As the weeks went by, the village of Smileville slowly began to look like its old self again. The fields were green once more, the houses were repaired, and the streets were clear of debris. But something had changed. The villagers had grown closer, and their bond was stronger than ever. They had faced a terrible storm and had come out of it not just as survivors, but as a community that cared for one another deeply. One evening, after a long day of work, the villagers gathered in the square for a celebration. It was the first time they had come together like this since the storm, and there was a sense of joy and relief in the air. The square was decorated with flowers, and the smell of delicious food filled the air. There was music, laughter, and the sound of children playing. Lily stood with her parents, looking out at the happy faces of her friends and neighbors. She felt a deep sense of pride and happiness. The village had been through so much, but they had come out stronger because they had stuck together. The village elder, a wise old woman named Granny Rose, stood up to speak. My dear friends, she began, we have been through a terrible time, but we have survived because we never lost hope. We have rebuilt our village with love, hard work, and a belief that together we can overcome anything. Granny Rose looked at Lily and smiled and we have a special person to thank for reminding us of that. Lily, your positive spirit and endless kindness have inspired us all. You have shown us that even in the darkest times, there is always a reason to smile. The villagers clapped and cheered for Lily, who blushed with pride. She hadn't done any of it for praise, but it felt good to know that she had made a difference. Lily stepped forward and spoke to the crowd. Thank you, everyone, but I didn't do this alone. We all work together to rebuild our village, and that's what makes Smileville special. It's not just a place. It's the people who live here. And as long as we have each other, there will always be a reason to be happy. The villagers cheered again, and the celebration continued long into the night. There was singing, dancing, and lots of laughter. For the first time in weeks, the villagers felt truly happy and at peace. As the night drew to a close, Lily looked up at the stars and made a silent promise to herself. She promised to always keep smiling, no matter what life threw her way. She knew that there would be more challenges in the future, but she also knew that with a positive attitude and the support of her community, she could get through anything. 
The story of Smileville's recovery began to spread to other villages and towns. People heard about how the villagers had come together to rebuild their homes and how a young girl named Lily had led them with her positive spirit. The story inspired many, and soon, visitors began to come to Smileville to learn from its people. One of the first visitors was a young man named Jack. He was from a nearby town that had also been hit by the storm, and he wanted to know how Smileville had recovered so quickly. When Jack arrived in Smileville, he was amazed by what he saw. The village was beautiful, the people were friendly, and there was a sense of happiness in the air that he hadn't felt in a long time. Jack sought out Lily and asked her, How did you do it? How did you stay so positive and help your village rebuild after such a terrible storm? Lily smiled and said, It wasn't easy, but I knew that we had to focus on what we still had, not on what we had lost. We had each other, and that was enough to start again. We worked together, helped each other, and never lost. I was born into a wealthy and influential family in Armagh, Northern Ireland. I was the younger of two daughters, and we were the only children. My sister was five years older than me, so we didn't play much together when I was young. I was only 11 years old when she got married. I remember her wedding day well. Many people came, all of them laughing, singing, and happy. But I felt sad when my sister left with her new husband, Mr. Byrne. She was always very nice to me, nicer than my mother. And so I cried when she went away to her new home in Belfast. My mother and father didn't love me. They wanted sons and were not very interested in me. About a year after my sister got married, a letter arrived from Mr. Byrne. He said that my sister was ill and that she wanted to come home to Armagh and stay with us to be with her family. I was sad that she was ill, but also very happy about her visit. They're leaving Belfast on Sunday, my father told me, and they're arriving here on Tuesday evening. Tuesday came, and it was a very long day. Hour after hour came and went, and I listened all the time for my sister and her husband. Now the sky was dark and soon it was midnight, but I couldn't sleep. I listened and waited. Suddenly, at about one o'clock in the morning, I heard a noise far away. I ran out of my bedroom and down to the living room. They're here, they're here, I called to my father, and we quickly opened the front door to see better. We waited there for a few minutes and heard the noise again, somebody crying far away in the night, but we saw nothing. There were no lights and no people there. We went outside, waiting to say hello and to help my sister with her bags, but nobody was there. Nobody came. I looked at my father and he looked at me. We didn't understand. I know I heard a noise, he said. Yes, I answered. I heard it too. Father, but where are they? We went back into the house without another word. We were suddenly afraid. The next day, a man arrived and told us that my sister had died. On Sunday, she felt very ill. On Monday, she was worse, and on Tuesday, at about one o'clock in the morning, she died at the same time that we were outside the house in the night, waiting for her. I never forgot that night. For the next two years, I was very sad. You could say that I stopped living. I didn't want to do anything or speak to anyone. 
Mr. Byrne soon married another young woman in Belfast, and I felt angry that he forgot my sister so quickly. I was now the only child of a rich and important family, so before I was 13 years old, men started to visit our home. They wanted to meet me and perhaps marry me, but I didn't like any of these men, and I thought I was too young to be married. When I was 15, my mother took me to Belfast. Belfast is a big city, she said. We're going to meet richer and more interesting men than the ones back home in Armagh. We can easily find you a good husband in Belfast. In Belfast, I began to be happier. I met a lot of friendly people, and I went dancing every evening. A lot of young men came to speak to me and asked me to dance. I liked talking to them. I started to live and laugh again, and I didn't think about my dead sister all the time. But my mother was not so happy. She wanted me to find a husband quickly. One night before I went to bed, she came into my room and said, Do you know Lord Alastair Fallon? Oh, yes, I answered. He's that unattractive old man from Carlingford. He's not unattractive, and he's not old, Fiona, my mother said quickly. He's from a very wealthy and important family, too, and he wants to marry you. He loves you. Loves me? Wants to marry me? But he's making a mistake, mother, I said. I don't love him. I can't marry somebody I don't love. Think about it, Fiona. My mother answered quietly. He's a good man, and he wants to marry you. You're a very lucky young woman. My mother left the room, and I sat quietly for a long time. Lord Alastair Fallon was a nice, friendly man, I thought. I didn't love him, no, but I did like him. He always talked about interesting things. I never felt happy at home with my mother and father, but I always felt better when I talked to him. The next morning when I saw my mother, I said only one word, yes. Lord Alastair Fallon and I got married the next spring. And two days after our wedding, we said goodbye to my family and left our ma. Three days later, we arrived in Carlingford, and I saw my husband's beautiful house for the first time. It was near a river, and there were many trees and flowers in the garden. Birds sang in the trees, and the sky was blue. I stood next to him and looked at it all, and I felt very, very happy. Come, my love, said my husband. You must come in and meet Agnes. She cooks and cleans and knows everything about the house. So we went into the house, and I met Agnes a friendly old woman with smiling blue eyes. She showed me around the house. Suddenly, I felt excited to be there. It was a very happy place. Women sang in the kitchen, men built fires in the living rooms, and there were dogs and cats everywhere. Come with me now, madam, said Agnes, and look at your bedroom. Then we can take up your bags and you can wash before dinner. I followed her, and soon we arrived at a big brown door. This is your room, she said, and she opened the door. I stood and looked, suddenly cold with fear. In front of me stood something big and black. 
I didn't know what it was. I thought it was an old coat, but without anybody inside it. I jumped back quickly, very afraid, and moved away from the door. Is something wrong, madam? Agnes asked me. Nothing. Perhaps it's nothing, I answered quickly. But I thought I saw something in there. I thought I saw a big black coat. When you opened the door, Agnes's face went white with fear. What's wrong? I asked her. Now you look frightened. Something bad is going to happen, she said. When someone sees the black coat in this house, we know that something bad is going to happen soon to the Fallon family. I saw the black coat when I was a child, and the next morning, old Lord Fallon died. Something bad is going to happen now. Madam, I know it. We went down to have dinner. I felt unhappy and afraid, but I didn't say anything to my husband about the black coat. I wanted to forget about it and be happy again. The next day, Lord Fallon and I went for a walk together to look around the house and gardens because I wanted to know my new home better. I like this house and all the people here, I said, and I'm happy to be here with you. It's much better than our ma. My husband was quiet for a long time. He walked with his head down, thinking. Then, suddenly, he turned to me, took my hand, and said, Fiona, listen to me. Listen carefully. There's something I must ask you. Please, please only go into the rooms in the front of the house. Never go into the rooms at the back of the building, or into the little garden by the back door. Never. Do you understand me, Fiona? His face was white and unhappy. I understood his words, but I didn't understand why he was suddenly a different man here at Carlingford. He never smiled or laughed anymore. Perhaps the back of the house was dangerous, I thought, but he didn't want to talk about it anymore. We went back to the house without speaking, and again I tried to forget his words and to be as happy as I was before. It was about a month later that I met the other woman for the first time. One day, I wanted to go for a walk in the gardens. It was a beautiful day, and I ran up to my room after lunch to get my hat and coat. But when I opened the door of my room, there was a woman sitting near the fire. She was about 40 years old, and she wore a black coat. Her face was white, and when I looked closely, I saw that her eyes were white too. She was blind. Madam, I said, this is my room. There is a mistake. Your room? She answered. A mistake? No, I don't think so. I don't think there's a mistake. Where is Lord Fallon? Down in the living room, I said. But who are you and why are you here in my room? Tell Lord Fallon that I want him, was all she said. I must tell you that I am Lady Fallon and I want you to leave my room now. I said, Lady Fallon, you are not, you are not, she cried and hit my face very hard. I cried out for help, and soon Lord Fallon arrived. I ran out of the room as he ran in, and I waited outside to listen at the door. I did not hear every word, but I knew that Lord Fallon was very angry, and the blind woman was very unhappy. When he came out, I asked him, who is that woman, and why is she in my bedroom? But my husband didn't answer me. Again, his face was white with fear. His only words were, forget her. But I did not forget her, and every day it was more and more difficult to talk to my husband. He was always quiet now, always sad and afraid. He sat for hours, looking into the fire with his unhappy eyes, but I didn't know why and he didn't want to tell me. One morning after breakfast, Lord Fallon suddenly said, I have the answer. We must go away to another country, to France or Spain perhaps. What do you think, Fiona? 
He didn't wait for my answer, but left the room very quickly. I sat and thought for a long time. Why must we leave Carlingford? I didn't understand, and I didn't want to go too far away from my mother and father in Armagh. They were old now, and my father was sometimes ill. They didn't love me very much, but I wanted to be near them. I thought about it all day, and I didn't know what to say to my husband when he arrived back in the evening and came in to dinner. I said nothing. After dinner, I was very tired, and I went up to my bedroom early. I wanted to have a good night's sleep and think about it all again the next day. I closed my eyes and went to sleep, but I did not sleep well because I dreamed of the black coat. Suddenly, I woke up. Everything was dark and very quiet, but somebody was at the end of my bed. There was a hand with a light, and behind the light was the blind woman. She had a knife in her other hand. I tried to get out of bed and run to the door, but she stopped me. If you want to live, don't move, she said. Tell me one thing, did Lord Fallon marry you? Yes, he did, I answered. He married me in front of a hundred people. Well, that's sad she said, because I don't think he told you that he had a wife, me. I am his wife, not you, young woman. You must leave this house tomorrow, because if you stay here, she raised the knife. You see this knife? I am going to kill you with it. Then she left the room without a sound. I didn't sleep again that night. When morning came, I told my husband everything. Who is the blind woman? I asked him. She told me last night that she is your wife, that I am not your wife. Did you go into the rooms at the back of the house? Asked my husband angrily. I told you that you must never go there. But I didn't, I answered. I was in my bed all night. She came to me. Please tell me what is happening. My husband's face was white again, and he didn't speak for a long time. Then he said, No, she is not my wife. You are. Don't listen to her. She doesn't know what she is saying. And he left the room. I ran to find Agnes. I didn't like this house anymore. My husband was a difficult man, and I didn't understand him. Who was the blind woman? I wanted to know everything. Don't cry, madam, said Agnes when I found her. Sit down and listen to me. What I am going to tell you is not very nice. The blind woman, the woman in the black coat, is dead. You saw her ghost. She was married to your husband, and she was Lady Fallon. Nobody knows how she died. Her bedroom was at the back of the house. Somebody saw your husband with a knife in his hand on the night she died. But did he kill her? Nobody knows. When we found her, the knife was on the floor next to her. And her eyes, somebody cut her eyes out after she died. Perhaps he didn't want her to see his other women. His next wife, you. I didn't wait to speak to my husband again. I left that day. I was too afraid to stay another minute at Carlingford. I knew that the blind woman was going to come back again and kill me. I said goodbye to Agnes, took my bags, and told my driver to take me back to Armagh. I am happy living here with my mother and father now. The house is quiet. I sleep well each night, and they are friendlier to me than they were before. Sometimes my dead sister visits me at night, but I am never afraid. She tells me that the blind woman is trying to find me at Carlingford and that she wants to kill me. She is jealous of me, but she can never find me there. She must wait 
for the next lady. Ever one- David was a poor boy. He lived in a small old house. His family was very poor. They had little money and few things. David had a father, a mother, a brother, and a sister. Despite their poverty, they were a happy family. But one day, everything changed. David's father got very sick. They had no money for the doctor. His father got worse and worse. Eventually, one day, he passed away. The family was very heartbroken. They cried a lot. David promised his mother he would take care of her and his sister. His brother tried to help too, but soon his brother fell ill with pneumonia. They had no money for medicine. David and his mother watched helplessly as his brother struggled with the illness. David felt very alone. He cried every night, but he knew he had to be strong for his family. After his father's death, the family became even poorer. His mother worked very hard, cleaning houses and washing clothes. It was not enough. Sometimes they had no food and went hungry. David wanted to help his mother. He promised her, I will work hard. I will become rich one day. I will take care of you and my sister. His mother hugged him and said, I believe in you, David. You are a good boy. Study hard and work hard. Never give up. Her words gave him hope. David loved to learn. He studied at home, reading old books and learning English. He worked very hard every day and never gave up, even when he was hungry. He wanted to keep his promise to his mother. David found small jobs. He cleaned streets, carried heavy bags, and worked in a factory. The work was hard. His hands hurt and his back ached, but he did not stop. He needed to earn money for his family. Sometimes, David cried when he was alone. He was sad and tired, but he remembered his promise. He wanted to make his mother proud. He kept studying English. He learned new words every day. He practiced speaking and wanted to be ready for any chance. David had a friend named Emma. They grew up together. Emma was kind and smart. David liked her very much. But Emma's family was not poor. They had money and wanted Emma to marry a rich man. One day, Emma's parents told David, You are poor. You cannot marry Emma. She needs a better life. David was heartbroken. He loved Emma, but he knew he was poor and had nothing to give her. Emma cried, too. She loved David, but had to obey her parents. David felt very sad. He lost his love because he was poor. He felt very alone and cried many nights, but he did not give up. He remembered his promise to his mother and sister and kept working hard. One day, a rich man came to the factory where David worked. The rich man's name was Mr. Anderson. He was the owner of the factory. Mr. Anderson heard David speak in English and was very surprised. Who taught you English? he asked. I learned it myself, David replied. Mr. Anderson was impressed. He saw that David was smart and hardworking. You have a talent, Mr. Anderson said. I want to help you. He offered David a better job in his office. David was very happy. He worked as Mr. Anderson's assistant and learned many new things. He worked very hard and always did his best. Mr. Anderson trusted him more and more. Years passed. David continued to work hard. Mr. Anderson saw that David was loyal and honest. He saw that David was smart and learned quickly. One day, Mr. Anderson said, David, you are ready. I want you to be the CEO of my company. David could not believe it. He thanked Mr. Anderson and promised to work even harder. As the CEO, David made the company grow. 
He was very successful and made a lot of money. He did not forget his promise to his mother. David saved his money and bought a big house. He wanted to surprise his mother and sister. One day, he brought them to the new house. This is our new home, he said. His mother and sister cried with joy. They hugged David and were so proud of him. David kept his promise. He became rich and took care of his mother and sister. David never forgot his struggles. He helped other poor children and gave them hope. He told them, never give up, work hard, believe in yourself. You can achieve your dreams. David's mother looked at him with tears in her eyes. You have made me very proud, David, she said. You are a good son. You have a big heart. David hugged his mother. He remembered all the hard times and his promise. His sister hugged him too. You are the best brother, she said. David smiled. He was happy. He had kept his promise and made his family proud. He had found success through hard work and determination. David knew that his journey was not just for himself. It was for everyone who struggled like he did. David continued to work hard and help others. His mother and sister were always by his side. Together, they made a happy family. They had tears of joy and hope for the future. David's story is a reminder that with hard work, determination, and a kind heart, anything is possible.